Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is just two o'clock now. So we are going to give people just a few more minutes to log in before we go live. Um, so just bear with us. And we'll probably officially start around 2.03 or so, 2.04. For those of you who are logging in, just bear with us. We're giving everyone a few more minutes to log on before we start the broadcast. Um, we're going to be kicking off officially at around 2.03, so just sit tight if you would. <coughs> Okay, I see it is about 2.03. Um, so I think for the interest of time, um, because we are all busy professionals here, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Danielle Brazil Hudson, and I am the Global Trade Compliance Director at Allen International. And I'm joined by my colleague, Jamie Tony, who is a Global Trade Compliance Leader at Allen. And we are excited and delighted to have been given the opportunity to speak with you today. I think it will be a good use of your time. Um, to give you a little background on who we are, I've been with Allen for about six years now. I am a licensed customs broker and my educational background is in political science and international relations. So some of the topics that we'll be going through today are right up my alley. And Jamie is our resident export and ITAR professional. And prior to joining our team at Allen, she worked several years for Fortune 500 companies as a trade compliance leader specializing in export compliance. As part of our positions at Allen, we have the privilege to consult with our clients on best practices in trade compliance and assist many of them to develop programs that allow them to mitigate risk and take advantage of savings. However, before we kick off, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items. We will be presenting for approximately 30 to 35 minutes. We will allow time at the end for questions and answers. We're going to be covering a wide variety of topics, so please be sure to submit your questions. We are able to see them at the end. Um, if we are not able to answer your question today, either Jamie or myself will respond within 48 hours personally in an email. And then lastly, please note that there will be a short survey that pops up on your screen after the presentation. We ask that you respond to the survey so that we can continue to put together awesome content in the future. Okay, now that the housekeeping is out of the way, let's jump into our topic. Mm 
Just give me one moment here. It seems like I'm having, there we go, technical difficulty there. Okay, so as previously mentioned, um, Jamie and I have the great joy of consulting with clients on best practices in the trade industry and assisting them with their compliance matters. However, many times trade compliance is considered a cost center or worse, the compliance role is considered that of the executioner or regulatory cop on the beat that is to be avoided as perfectly illustrated in this cartoon. And even then, that perception is prevalent mostly in companies that employ a compliance function. Very often, compliance is brought to the forefront only after an issue has arisen or a company is being subjected to desk audit from Customs and Border Protection. Thus, when we began to brainstorm topic ideas for this webinar, we thought it may be useful to begin fleshing out a misguided approach to compliance and instead propose a proactive compliance regime that is more in line with changing trade operations globally. Today, we will be visiting a variety of topics, starting with a brief explanation of informed compliance. Then we will take a look at some of the catalysts for change in global trade. Next, we will take a look at some stats that support the premise that multinationals are not placing an adequate focus on compliance training and what the potential risk for lazy compliance can be. Lastly, we will take a look at best practices and compliance solutions for the savvy multinational. So to begin with, we have to explain the concepts of informed compliance and why any of this talk is important. Due to a couple of pieces of reform legislation introduced in the 20th century, the United States is what we call an informed compliance country. This is a change up to the classic enforced compliance system where customs goes through each individual shipment to enforce duty and best practices. The informed compliance system does away with this idea and asks that the importer share compliance responsibilities with customs and takes reasonable care to ensure that they are meeting all governmental requirements. Ways that companies can show that they are practicing reasonable care include the use of experts for trade consulting, regular post-entry activity auditing for compliance and correctness of entries, and also recording reliable justifications for classification and compliance determinations. I think it's important to note that while the United States is not the only informed compliance country, there are still plenty of countries that require inspection on every shipment. Thus, having a flexible and nimble compliance program able to navigate customs regulations in each country in which a company does business is not just a nice to have, it is now a necessity. So, now that we have an understanding from a regulatory and responsibility perspective, let's dig into some of the driving forces that continue to pressure supply chain and necessitate that multinational corporations begin paying attention to trade compliance. Catalysts for change in international trade can be distributed into a few different core buckets in my mind and include globalization, geopolitics, and technology. Globalization, which I will define as increased movement of people, knowledge, and ideas, and goods and money across national borders, has not only grown global operations and opened up markets to new players, but has also increased the complexity of supply chains. Geopolitics, especially those characterized by terrorism, political instability, and uncertainty, impact global trade by highlighting security concerns and enhancing regulatory adjustments. Two recent examples of geopolitics impacting global trade would be the very recent Section 232 and Section 301 tariffs that have been recently lodged by the United States Trade Representative. This example, as I mentioned, is incredibly recent. And in fact, in the last two weeks, we have seen retaliatory tariffs imposed on the US products by our closest trade allies. Um, this is perpetuating what many have termed a trade war, kind of ratched up 
phrase that went into effect after the Section 301 tariffs prompted retaliatory tariffs from China. A second example that is still on the horizon, though not as recent as the, the tariff increases, um, but for those of us who are in the trade community is something that we are waiting to see what happens the out, from the outcome is Brexit. And that was the decision of the UK to leave the European Union. Um, and that decision will impact free trade agreements, tariffs and trade relationships. And then last, but certainly not least, and, and maybe most excitingly, technological advances and innovations are also changing how we do business and think about global trade. A very few neat and recent innovations include agile manufacturing, as with 3D printing. This one has been in the news and all over some blogs that I follow recently. I think there was one recently where um, we were able to send the specs for a tool that they needed in space and an astronaut was able to create that wrench out in space through agile manufacturing. So very, very interesting um, when we think of 3D printing. Um, other technologies include increasing drone technology, the growth of e-commerce and the development of smart ship technologies. The technological advances that have been made and are being made have increased the speed of today's business and elevated the necessity of constant innovation to meet market demand and keep from falling behind global competition. The bottom line is as trade complexity increases and technological and political forces add pressures on existing trade operations, it will be necessary to ensure flexibility, visibility, and compliance in all areas of the chain from engineering and manufacturing to finance and legal. Unfortunately, as I stated in my introduction, many, many multinational companies are falling dangerously behind in ensuring their businesses and employees are prepared to navigate changing global realities. In a survey of 322 executives at US-based global companies, the trade management firm Amber Road found that 56% of the executives they interviewed said their organizations are not investing in trade compliance training, even though half of that number had been fined or warned previously about their non-compliance. Of 73% of respondents who said their companies have a trade compliance plan, more than half do not require employee training on it, and some require only 11 hours or less. Furthermore, 55% had not standardized their global trade compliance training, and 33% did not have a budget for trade compliance training. Those training statistics reveal that the true cost of negligence can be significant. Risk include delays, seizures, audits, investigations, liquidated damages. For example, Ex-importers who are found to be culpable of negligence can be fined as much as two times the lost revenue or up to 20% of the duty value for non-revenue loss. When considering export violations, the stakes are even higher. Imposed penalties can reach 20 years imprisonment and $1 million per violation. And last but certainly not least, non-compliance can result in loss of import privileges. To give you some contact, Context as to the consequences of lazy compliance, let's consider a few examples. First, we will look at the most recently posted criminal offenses and consequences stats from the BIS. And then we will take a look at two recent examples. First, according to the 2016 BIS stats, 32 individuals and businesses were criminally convicted. $274,000 in criminal fines, 79 million in forfeitures, a combined 883 months of imprisonment and 35 civil administrative cases with the government. Access USA of Sarasota, Florida was convicted of 129 counts of evasion, 17 counts of exporting without a license and four counts of exporting to a sanctioned entity. They were fined $23 million of which 17 million was suspended 
for a two-year probationary period. They legally shipped rifle scopes, night vision lenses, weapon parts, and AR-99 items. Another case involved six U.S. Army soldiers and two civilian eBay sellers. They were found guilty of conspiracy to steal and sell U.S. Army property, counts of wire fraud, and violating the Arms Export Control Act. The men stole from the Fort Campbell Army installation in Kentucky to help with financial problems or support their drug addictions. They would then put the items on eBay. Some of the items listed on eBay were sniper telescopes, grenade launchers, and assault rifles. They sold these items around the world, including customers in Russia and China. However, there is a bright side. <laughs> I know those stats are scary, but I did say there was a bright side. Um, remember I said that savvy, savvy multinationals treat trade compliance as both a savings and a risk mitigation center? To be sure, there are industry best practices that can assist businesses to optimize trade operations, minimize risk and exposure, and create the flexibility and control that will be required to navigate changes moving forward. In their 2012 white paper, Integrated Trade Compliance Strategies, Seven Best Practices of Leading Traders, GHY International synthesized their findings of a survey conducted on multinational companies. Some companies had what GHY terms a siloed approach to compliance, while others had an integrated model. Looking at both models, GHY concluded that the participants with the integrated model in which trade compliance was treated as a critical issue across the organization, were better equipped to handle rapid globalization, supply chain complexity, and regulatory changes. They outlined seven best practices that were foremost if a company were to begin championing compliance. And those seven corporate best compliance practices first start with corporate leadership identifying global trade compliance as a priority and linking compliance to business success. Second, a team must be appointed to own trade compliance across the enterprise. This one is an interesting one. I follow many trade compliance blogs and chat rooms of trade professionals. And I saw a question recently on one of these chat rooms where it was asked, where should trade compliance sit in an organization? Um, my answer is it depends on the company or the, or the multinational. At Allen, like I've mentioned, we have the, the privilege of working with many Fortune 500 and Fortune 100 companies, and we have corporate um, leaders that sit in tax, some who sit in legal, um, others who report through operations and supply chain. Um, I think depending on the type of business that you are in or some of the challenges a company may have experienced in the past, that is what is going to determine where the trade compliance team um, should live in the organization. However, according to GHY and their paper, um, it's most important that there is a team that um, owns compliance across the enterprise. Third, key performance indicators have been developed to measure and report on corporate trade compliance priorities. This is a huge one, and I, I think um, I've seen a huge push recently in our industry to really optimize key performance indicators. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about broker management in a few slides, but some of the key performance indicators that um, I've seen come out that are of real interest to companies recently would be like um, tracking clearance time from arrival. Um, other key performance indicators would be how brokers are performing on post-entry audits. Are they following parts lists? Are they declaring the correct country of origin? Um, companies that are able to track these key performance indicators have a better time understanding where their risks are and then therefore mitigating it. Fourth, systems have been put in place to track and measure trade compliance variables in supply chains 
and sales channels. Fifth, communication and meeting protocols are in place to track current and emerging trade compliance issues. This is a huge one right now. Um, I think more than any time that I've experienced in the last six years, um, this is definitely an exciting time to be in trade compliance, but it's also can be an uncertain time as regulations change or as new policies emerge. It's important more than ever for the trade compliance teams at multinationals to be working with their partners and different areas in the business to ensure that sales understands what's going on with new tariff increases or how that will have an impact um, or how retaliatory tariffs, for example, will have an impact on where they send shipments in the future. So um, it's, it's incredibly important to increase communication at a time where there's so much trade um, uncertainty. Sixth is that trade compliance factors are integrated into plans for growth and expansion in new markets. This is a huge one, particularly for multinationals that have several different business units. If you are going to be sending goods into India now, you've never been in that market before, it's best to maybe do some tests beforehand to see how your product is um, not, not only going to do in that market, there are softwares out there or, or compliance partners that you can hire that can tell you if the, if the market is already submerged with the type of product that you sell. That would be one thing you should consider. Another thing would be, what are you going to get hit with in tariffs and duty? Um, are there ways right off the bat before you start sending your product to India in our current example um, that you can look at that's going to save you money. We had a client maybe two years ago um, who had come to us, was doing this very type of research and said, we wanna look at every opportunity we can to, you know, to save on duty impact. Can you, can you take a look at these markets for us and tell us how we can you know, send our products? Does it make sense to send it in, in different parts? Does it make sense to bring them in as uh, full complete units? And we were able to help out with that. So I, I think it's an extremely useful exercise and definitely a, a best practice for multinational companies. And then seven, um, professional service providers are engaged as partners in achieving global trade compliance success. This one is very similar in my mind to the first um, and second, the compliance team. The level of need for a service partner is going to depend on your business. Um, if you are a business that has a low volume of shipments, but those types of shipments tend to be incredibly risky, then you might engage with a service provider um, in, in the legal field in trade compliance, for example, that can help you mitigate um, any of the risk if you're sending things to high risk countries, right? If you're exporting or you're importing in these high risk countries. Or if you are reporting up through operations supply chain and your trade compliance team internally is very small, you may consider hiring out to a service provider partner that would be able to staff um, individuals with the expertise to run your entire trade compliance department or portfolio. Uh, it's really going to depend on you as a multinational, what your needs are um, and what you can staff for. Further, best in class multinational organizations recognize that detailed implementation and operational administration of key compliance solutions aid companies in achieving operational efficiency and rapid response to regulatory change while ensuring that they are not leaving money on the table in the form of free trade agreements or other useful duty mitigation tools. On this slide, we outline a sample of the most effective compliance operations. It includes broker management, and you can kind of think about that in terms of standardizing business rules and operating procedures for your brokers, post-entry auditing, record keeping, and proper customs valuation. We also think identifying, identifying savings through free, free trade agreements and other duty mitigation tools and reporting the key performance assessments are other tools that you need to have in your customs compliance program. Companies that put a focus on compliance and implement tried and true solutions 
can expect flexible trade programs that quickly respond to regulatory and corporate policy changes, as well as enhance the collaboration across product management, procurement, and the brokers. Okay, so for what it's worth, I want to touch on a couple of these. Um, you know, when we had sent out the invites for this presentation, we said we'd be talking about different trends and things that we are seeing. Um, so this is a great slide because it definitely highlights um, the different compliance solutions that the industry has stated. You know, these are what you should be looking at when you're running your compliance portfolio. And certainly they align with what GHY had found in their presentation paper as we previously spoke about. But there are a few things on this slide that have really come up recently. Um, one of them is valuation. Um, if you are a large company, or even a small one, but you have a few different entities in different countries, um, it's really important for you to realize upfront that Customs has a different valuation methodology than IRS. Um, I've had clients come to us in the past and say, we need some help ensuring that our trade practices as it relates to valuation are compliant. You know, we've had some questions recently from Customs and Border Protection. We're really not sure how to answer them. All that we have are these tax reviews that we have our, our tax consultant do with us. And we think we're compliant as it relates to intercompany transactions because we, we apply a certain markup and, you know, the IRS has always seemed happy. And the first thing I say to them is that's wonderful. And I'm so glad that you have that tied off on the tax side. But please be aware that Customs has their own valuation methodology and they are expecting that importers of record understand those valuation methodologies and that they are applying them to each of their transactions. So this is one that has been coming up. It's one that will continue to come up, especially when we think of things like tariffs, right? Um, if there's tariff increases now more than ever, there is going to be um, customs agents really taking a look at how you're valuing your products when you're bringing them in. Um, they're going to want to ensure that the value of the products matches what you know the descriptions are and the HES tariff classification. Um, you may see an increase in the types of government communications that you're getting by way of you know Customs Form 28. So, if this is kind of a blank space for you and you are a leader in your business as it relates to trade compliance or you're a logistics manager, or supply chain manager that has trade compliance wrap up underneath you it might behoove you now in this environment to ask, hey, what is our value? What is our valuation methodology as it relates to trade compliance? I'm curious. I want to make sure that we are valuing our products according to the rules laid out by customs. Um, another one I wanted to hit on was the post entry audit. There are software solutions now. Um, Alan has one of them. There are other companies that, is, that do as well, where you as a business are able to perform a post-entry audit on 100% of the entries that you have coming into a country, okay? Um, there are certain larger multinational companies that I know of that are still performing a manual audit where perhaps you're only looking at about 5% to 10% of your entries, which is good. At least there is a post-entry audit function going on. This is something that I'm seeing pop up more in Canada as, as being something that Customs and Border Protection is really interested in. It's also a tool that you're going to be able to use to see where your risks are and to figure out maybe where your brokers are not performing where you'd want them to. And that feeds into that broker management piece that we had mentioned previously. Um, if you're a large company, you should have things like part lists that are going to your broker that they should be working off of um, and applying the correct classification, the correct country of origin. Well, the only way you'll be able to see that is if you have that post entry audit function occurring on the back end. OK, so incredibly important. Um, it's something that you want to have in your portfolio or put someone on on your team if you don't already because again that's where you're going to not only be able to find the risk but also potentially find savings okay we've found tons of savings for our clients through providing post-entry audits where we said hmm you weren't necessarily taking advantage of NAFTA here maybe we can or you weren't taking advantage of um a trade agreement with Brazil but you can recursor for example so different different things can pop up through that post-entry audit function. 
So in summation, and I know we've covered a lot of ground, um, but if you can walk away with one core concept from this presentation, I think former U.S. Deputy Paul McNulty said it best um, when he said, if you think compliance is expensive, try non-compliance. The reality is, as we discuss, that as time progresses, supply chains will become more complex, regulations will be modified and developed, and political situations will need to be dealt with, probably with an impact to global operations. Further, while I utilize the term multinational company frequently today, um, the issues discussed in this presentation will soon be a reality if they are not already for small to medium-sized businesses that must innovate both through technology and human capital to keep up with market competition and frankly, the expected doubling of knowledge growth. One statistic that I read recently stated that forces like the internet are doubling knowledge every 12 hours. <laughs> That's fantastic when we consider that at the end of World War II, knowledge was doubling every 25 years. We are living in a time when we are seriously looking into putting people on Mars. Okay, the stuff that was formerly of science fiction is now becoming a reality through different technologies and individuals who are bringing it to the forefront. Um, so the drama of technological advancement will continue to be on, and so companies will need to be equipped to handle new realities. So as this is the case, it is in a company's best interest to stay on top of trade compliance and to better yet, which is our hope, integrate trade compliance into its corporate strategy, treating it as a means of business success. All right. So that concludes the formal presentation, and we ended it right within that 30-minute time frame. So we're going to have some time for some questions and answers. Okay, let me see what we have. All right, we have one here. How can a company prepare for a customs audit? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, there are several ways that a company can prepare for a customs audit. And the first thing I will mention will be to prepare way before the customs audit mm -hmm. through things like post-entry activity, okay? Um, when it comes to the United States, um, just I hate to be United States centric right now, but I, I do think we have many tools and so do our, our partners to the North in Canada that I'm aware of, where you are able as a company to fix before customs becomes aware of it, any issues may, you may become aware of um, in your trade program, right? So long as you are performing this post entry activity, you will be able to see what that risk is. Perhaps you determine that um, you have been applying a incorrect classification on shipments for some time, okay? And you become aware of that through your post-entry activity. You are able to file a prior disclosure to customs whereby you can mitigate some of the penalties that might be associated with customs coming in and performing a desk audit and finding that, you know, information. Um, another thing that a, a wise company would do would be to read the materials that Customs has put out for you, read the informed compliance publications, sign up for federal register alerts. Um, U.S. Customs and Border Protection through ACE, they have ACE alerts that you can sign up for where you'll be seeing what's going on in that environment. I highly recommend um, these resources because I think as, you know, individuals either who are trade professionals or who have trade professionals that wrap up underneath them and you are the logistics manager, the supply chain manager, the legal counsel, um, it's really important for you to understand what's going on so that you can keep ahead and keep your processes and your procedures and your brokers accountable for um, so basically before customs comes in and, and does an audit, making sure your books are in order. Um, how about Jamie on the, on the export side, what can some people do to to make sure they have everything, all their ducks in a row before a customs audit? Well, I always say you need to have a plan for if the government shows up at your door. And most people always forget about this step, but your employees need to know what to do if the government shows up. So you need to have a plan, which will include things like 
making sure you have outlined who will speak with the with the um, officers. Not everyone should speak with the officers. At least have one or two people available for that. Make sure you know you might want to call your general counsel if it's something serious. Make sure they have a designated workspace. Do not have the government just roaming your office. Um, provide them with only the things they ask for. Do not provide any more, but do not seem like you're hiding anything also, but just you know, provide them with what they need. Um, you just you need to have a plan and a lot of companies don't. So when they, they are allowed spot checkups. So um, just be prepared for that. And um, it's especially true on the export side because that's where a lot of the penalties come from. One other thing, as you were talking, Jamie, I, I thought of was on the record keeping side, mm -hmm. um, both for export and for it, import, it's incredibly important that you retain your records, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are time frames for how long you need to hold on to things. Um, in general, we tell people at least five years. You know, when we're talking about different trade functions like drawback or, you know, now we're talking, you know, three years you need to hold on to records. But in general, I, I like to tell people, if possible, hold on to them forever. <laughs> and they can be electronically. They can be electronically. You just, um, on the import side, sometimes you have to get permission for customs for that, but that's just writing them a letter mm -hmm. telling them that. So you can keep them electronically. Electronically. Um, one of the things I mentioned in the regulations is microfiche. I don't know that anyone's doing that anymore, but there are no one's <laughs> doing that. There are tons of software <laughs> solutions now where you, you know, you can either hire a service partner um, that can hold on to these records for you, or you can um, log into a global trade management system. They call them GTMs. It's kind of the acronym that's out there floating around nowadays that um, will have a record keeping function as well. So that was something that came up when Jamie was talking, you know, when customs comes to your door, they're, they're going to they want you to open your books. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that you have access to those documents so that they're able to do it. At the minimum, you should be able to get your document. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> All right, let's take a look and see what other questions we have. Okay, here's, here's one. Have there been any technological advances that have made trade compliance easier? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we talked, um, I just spoke about GTMs or global trade management systems. There are a ton of them out there and there are as many service providers uh, that are making these softwares. Some of them are very simple in what they do. You know, they, they have a parts maintenance database. They'll have a record keeping module. Uh, maybe they'll employ that post entry audit functionality that I told you about. Now I'm talking specifically for GTMs that can be used by the importer, right? We, um, our brokers or the individuals who are writing the entries and communicating with customs on your behalf and filing entries with customs, they probably have their own internal systems too. But I'm talking in general for the, the savvy importer, there's lots of um, global trade management systems that you know can make your life easy. Uh, as part of my job, I have a lot of software folks that come in and they show me what they have to offer and you know we do use some software solutions here at Allen for our analysts so we can stay on top of the latest technology that's out there to make our lives easier and then our clients lives easier um, and some of the stuff that I've seen that's been pretty neat that's come out is um, these different HTS generators you know you can put in a description of a product and kind of boil it down to the first six of an HTS which is pretty interesting um, I think there still needs to be a human element there just to check and make sure that that absolutely fits your your product. But in a crunch, you know, that can make someone's life easier. Um, different softwares where the regulations will be loaded up and then you can have like a kind of a highlight and um, almost like a post-it function so that you can keep your place if you were to, you know, have to flip back and forth through several pages online of, of where they're looking for regulations. So things like this, I do think make trade um, a little easier to, to the average person or, or importer who maybe is not a licensed customs broker or really knows the business inside and out, um, but who works in it and um, needs to understand at least the fundamentals. So I would say GTMs are one. 
for sure. I also will just put a plug in there. I, I do think, and if there's any brokers online, they might agree, um, that the single window systems that have come out mm -hmm. are also making life a little easier for us. Um, so what I mean by single window system would be like ACE mm -hmm. technology here in the US. Um, I've seen single windows come out in Russia, in Mexico. Um, and basically this idea came out of the safe framework of standards after 9-11. Um, where members of the World Trade Organization came together and said, well, how can we make terrorism a little harder, mm -hmm. right, in the trade community? And one of the ways they came up with that is uh, through these single window systems whereby countries will be both importing and exporting, so filing all the paperwork and communicating with customs through one window. Um, I do think that makes life a little easier as well. Plus, keeps us safe and keeps our supply chain safe, so there's always an added benefit. Okay. Hmm. All right, we've got one more, it looks like, here. Oh, this is a good one, Jamie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How can we determine if our products are eligible for free trade agreements or special trade agreements? Um, mm. I love this one because this is something that we do. Um, and this is probably one of the primary functions that uh, a service partner or a person with expertise on your team can really start changing the idea out there of compliance only being a cost center. I see that on so many blogs. We're considered a cost center. No one pays attention to us. You know, we don't really generate any, any revenue. No, mm -hmm. you don't generate revenue, but you can generate savings if you're smart. Um, and so what we always do and where we start if a company comes to us and says, look, I, I need to see if I have any savings anywhere, is we'll take a look at the data. We'll say, get us your data, right? Let's let's see what your import data is. Um, I'll use the North American Free Trade Agreement because I think many of us on, on this call are aware of that. That is a free trade agreement um, among the trading partners in North America, so United States, Canada, and Mexico. And so if we, had a company that came to us and said, we want to make sure that we are taking full advantage of our NAFTA savings or North American Free Trade Agreement savings, we'd say send us your data. And we'd take a look and we'd start just combing through the transactions, seeing how many products you have that are coming from partner countries, what those values are, um, calculating it out, determining whether or not you've actually taken advantage of it. You can even do an audit to see if you for those shipments that you did claim NASA, if you had done so compliantly, or maybe you left money on the table. So I think, you know, we talked about in the last, maybe the question before last, what's important to have on file for customs audit, and that was a great question too. Um, your data is, is probably one of your most important tools in your tool shed because you can go back to it and you can determine your trends mm -hmm. and where you were leaving money on the table um, and opportunity, right? Like maybe your company can take advantage of drawback if you are a manufacturer and you have really good import export records and maybe you're not utilizing everything that you're bringing in. That might be something that you could take advantage of. Uh, potentially, let's say you're a company that you find out um, you might have to do some valuation reconciliation because you determine you're, you're not valuing your goods. Um, maybe you're valuing your goods too high at the time that you're bringing it in, and you can reconcile that at the end of a quarter um, and maybe get some money back when you, you actually have the, the verifiable, what was actually paid, the price paid and payable for those goods. So um, your data is going to be what drives whether or not you're leaving money on the table as it relates to special programs and free trade agreements. You should probably always start there when doing a deep dive. And I would put a plug, it might be a little self-serving, but you, you probably want to partner with a, a service provider that has the expertise looking at that, unless you have that expertise on your team, in which case I would highly recommend that person take a look at that data. One more just came in. Um, are there any key performance indicators that I can use to determine how strong my trade compliance processes are. This is a good one. We mentioned some 
key performance indicators throughout the presentation. Um, you know, the one I like, I, I mentioned it, but the one I like a lot is if you can get this data from your broker. And I know there's probably some of you sitting out there that are like, gosh, I only get like three lines from my broker. <laughs> and it shows enter date and the classification that mm -hmm. you use. Um, but I'm here to tell you that your broker can actually send you a lot of more information if you ask for it. But in any case, it's a different conversation. Um, one key performance indicator that I really like is tracking um, clearance time from arrival. Mm -hmm. I like that because so many of us operate in what's called the broker first model, where a pre alert is sent to the broker and the broker checks against part list to determine um, what they might need on a shipment, right? I think that key performance indicator there where you're measuring the lead time between your custom clearance to your arrival is going to be a lead time that will make sense to the rest of the enterprise, right? It's going to make sense to your supply chain folks, it's going to make sense to your sales folks to say, look, it's on average taking five days to get something into Mexico. Maybe we need to work with our vendors and our suppliers to get us paperwork a lot sooner so that we can send it to the broker down there and they can do a lot of this pre-work prior to the shipment even being in the air or in the truck. Um, I think you, you also end up finding out through that measurement when you really start deep diving into the different countries of import, like let's say you're a multinational that does work in 17 countries and you're able to measure that lead time in each of those countries, when you really start nailing it down and talking to your brokers to say, well, what is causing this lead time to take, why is it taking 50 days to get something into Russia? The broker might surprise you and say, it's because we typically don't have certificates of origin when we receive the paperwork. And so now we have to go back to the vendor to get that information. Or they might say your invoices from your vendors from Acnico always comes in without classifications. And so it takes us forever to, to get that info. So um, I really love that stat. I think it's a great one. Um, and again, if you're able to work with your broker to get you that information, the entry date, the clearance date, the arrival date, it can, can really change things for you, not only to show your sales folks and your supply chain folks just how long it takes to get something into a country from a compliance perspective, but then also to nail down your processes and to see where you can do better. So that one would be one I would recommend. Okay. I'm looking at the board. Doesn't look like there are any other questions right now, so we will wrap up. Um, if anyone on the call comes up with anything when, you know, you're back at your desk or um, in the next week or so, or even in the future, please, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. We are here to help. Um, my contact information is up on the screen. Um, so sh shoot it off to us and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, I think I speak for both Jamie and myself when I say thank you very much for joining us today. I had fun. Um, I had fun. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd be remiss if you found this information helpful or interesting. Um, if I didn't mention for you to please log on to our website at um, allenintel.com and check out the publications, not only from trade compliance, but also from the other polls of our business. Allen does business um, in three different polls. We have transportation management, trade compliance, and tax. And on our website, we have publications from all of those polls. If you are a tax professional joining us today, Please note that our tax department is also doing podcasts, which are really informative. So if you liked this, join us for our next installment of the Allen International um, Essentials series. Check out our publications. Check out our podcasts. Um, I hope you all join us again and have a great rest of your afternoon. Have a good one.